teeth, I don't see, I, I don't see, check that out and see if that's really on. I don't see that red. Okay, good enough. Thank you so much. The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. Now this is going to be a little bit different, but I, I, just, I just trust with all my heart the Lord is going to really make this come alive. This is an analogy between the Ark of the Covenant and the church today as we see it. Not the true body of Christ, but the church, universal. So I'm not talking about a certain denomination. I'm talking about the church, universal, throughout the land. And the analogy between the ark and the Old Testament and what we see with the modern church is really remarkable. The ark of the covenant, also known as the ark of the testimony, or the ark of God, is believed to have been the most sacred religious relic of the Israelites. There wasn't anything to compare to the holiness of this ark, the, way, the reverence that God wanted them to show, and, and, and how, what happened to it is remarkable, and comparing that with the church today is also very remarkable. It is described as a wooden chest, coated, in pure gold, topped off by an elaborate golden lid known as the mercy seat. According to the book of Exodus and the first book of Kings, the ark contained the tablets of the law by which God delivered the Ten Commandments to Moses at Mount Sinai. According to the book of Exodus, the book of Numbers, and the epistle to the Hebrews, it also contained Aaron's rod and a pot of manna. Now, the beauty of this ark, now this is just a, this is a representative of what somebody thought by what's in the Bible, the dimensions of it, describing it, and I think that the artist design is kind of remarkable, but the beauty of this had to be just outstanding, absolutely outstanding. Now this is in Exodus, and we read this, then the Lord said to Moses, look, I have specifically chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, grandson of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God, giving him great wisdom, ability, and expertise in all kinds of crafts. He is a master craftsman, expert in working with gold, silver, and bronze. He is skilled in engraving and mounting gemstones and in carving wood. He is a master at every craft. And I have personally appointed Aholiab, son of Ahishamach, of the tribe of Dan, to be his assistant. Moreover, I have given special skill to all the gifted craftsmen so they can make all the things I have commanded you to make. Now, I want to make it clear, I'm not, this isn't going to be an in-depth study about just the ark. It's the analogy part that I really want to, to emphasize, but if you wanted to do a study on the ark, believe me, there's tons of books. This is just a few, but that's really not, not the purpose of my message this evening. The ark of the covenant. Now, the word ark literally means chest. Coffin is even one of the original words from, that, from, the, from the Hebrew word used for that, ark. But this is the ultimate meaning of the ark. The embodiment of God's presence. That's what the ark ultimately was representing. And God wanted the holiness of this to be recognized by the people. Now, even, even beyond that, he had even a further purpose for the people to understand that the ark represented the presence of God. The, the presence of God didn't literally live in that box, but it was representative. That's very important to understand as we go through this. Now, this is, this is in John, and I want you now to do a comparison of what I just described about the ark to what we read here in John. The Word became flesh 
and made his dwelling among us. In other words, the testimony of God became flesh. The testimony of God was in the ark. Now think about that. The ark was a foreshadowing of Jesus. That's exactly, there's many, many things in the Old Testament that were a copy or a shadow of what would be fulfilled in Jesus. But this is really remarkable. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, as I said, Jesus was foreshadowed in the ark of the testimony. In Colossians, we read this, for in Christ lives all the fullness. Look at that, the embodiment. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. The ark represented the presence of God. Jesus is the very presence of God. God in the flesh. In Numbers, we read this. They marched for three days after leaving the mountain of the Lord with the ark of the Lord's covenant moving ahead of them. What a picture of the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Now think about this. The ark went in front and was leading them. Remember that they had a, they had a cloud by day. They had a fire by night. And that what a beautiful picture of being led by the Holy Spirit. Whenever Moses went into the tabernacle to speak with the Lord, he heard the voice speaking to him from between the two cherubim above the ark's cover, the place of atonement that rests on the ark of the covenant. The Lord spoke to him there. Now look again, we're going to go in the New Testament and look what Jesus said. He said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. One thing I really, really hope you get overcome with tonight, as I was being led to put this message together, it really overcame me. And here, well, here's what it was, is how much we take for granted what God's given us. When you really begin to see in the Old Testament, the tabernacle, the ark, the high priest, how often he was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. All of that, and so elaborate, was pointing to a fulfillment in our Savior, in our Lord and Savior Jesus. And look, and, and think about this. Well, I'm almost jumping ahead of myself. That's why I love using PowerPoint. It keeps me right, right on track. In Hebrews, we read this. So then, and by the way, Hebrews is a beautiful book to read for a lot of things pertaining to the tabernacle and explaining the fulfillment that's in Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews, who really don't know who that writer was. Some people think it was Paul, some others. We don't really know for sure, but Hebrews is a, is a marvelous book. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. Look at that. Firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. For he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. Oh, my friends, this is remarkable. And my question that I want to ask, and you be thinking about as we go through this, do you take advantage of that? And how often do you take advantage of it? You know, you might pray through the day, or something's on your mind and you're working, you kind of pray as you're working. There's nothing wrong with that. But I mean as far as stopping, sitting down, get on your knees, get in a room, do something, and give the Lord Jesus Christ your 100% total attention, how often do you do it? Or do you rush it? Do you feel like, I just really don't have all that much time. I have a hard time. You think about the high priest that could only enter the Holy of Holies once a year. And that, not without blood. I mean, there had to be a lot of sacrifice before he could even do that. It was a real ritual. But we can go into the throne room 
of Almighty God any time, any place. And yet we are so we are so nonchalant about it. That's convicting. It's con- very convicting to me. There we will receive his mercy. Now, talking about the ark, what was, a, what was part of the lid? Do you remember? What, what was it called? Mercy seat. Look at this. Mercy seat. And look at now. We can come boldly into the very throne room of our gracious God and we will receive mercy. The ark was depicted with that mercy seat above it. And we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Again, in Hebrews, above the ark were the cherubim of divine glory, whose wings stretched out over the ark's cover, the place of atonement. But we cannot explain these things in detail now. I can just see the writer thinking, wow, there is so much I could tell you right now with this, with this, all of this, what it really, what it, um, is significant and and what it is really resembling. He said, I can't do it now, but we can't explain these things in detail now. When these things were all in place, the priest regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duties. But only the high priest ever entered the most holy place and only once a year. People, does that grab your heart? It should, you should, I mean, you almost should weep. You almost should start weeping. Look what God's done for us. And we're so, care, we're so carefree about it, aren't we? We're just, well, yeah, that's kind of nice. There's, it's, it should be extremely convicting. It was so important that God's people understood the holiness of the ark. It was imperative. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, we're going to look at the moving of the ark to Jerusalem. Now, in a little while, we're actually going to go back to a time period prior to this, but I'm going here first because I want you to really recognize something about the holiness, the holiness of the ark. Then David gathered together all the elite troops in Israel, 30,000 in all. He led them to Bala of Judah to bring back the Ark of God. The Ark had been away for quite a while, a long time. They placed the Ark of God. I'm sorry, they placed the Ark of God on a new cart. Do you see something wrong with that statement? Does anybody catch anything about that? Was that proper? It was never to be put on a cart. Never. And also, it was a very strict ruling on how the ark was to be carried. Kohath, one of the sons of Levite, it was sons of Kohath. It was their duty only. They were the only ones that could carry the ark, and they had to carry it. That's why the poles were in the ark. You saw that picture just a little bit ago. They were the only ones who could carry the ark. So... They put put the ark on a new cart and brought it from Abinadab's house, which was on a hill. Uzzah and Ahio, Abinadab's sons, were guiding the cart that carried the ark of God. Ahio walked in front of the ark. David and all the people of Israel, look at that, they were celebrating before the Lord, singing songs and playing all kinds of musical instruments, lyres, harps, tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. Now, this is so important that you grab this. Please do, do your best. We think today that the ultimate way to enter God's presence in a big meeting is to have dynamic praise and worship. I mean, come on, right? Am I right about that? I mean, all kinds of musical instruments, the louder, the better, the longer, the greater. I mean, give it all you got. Well, I don't think anything we've done today can compare with what they did. But there's this mentality. If we praise God loud enough, long enough, I mean, we give him all of our heart and soul, make a great big noise, it's like that covers everything else. I mean, that, when God sees that, the other stuff that might be lacking doesn't really matter. Because God is so impressed with the noise we're making 
Now, we don't think of it as noise. We think of it as just wonderful, great praise that God's going to be so pleased. Well, you would think that with the way they were praising God, surely, I mean, God must be so pleased. Well, the first thing, he was already very, very disappointed because of the ark when it was first. You're going to see that in a little while where it was taken. He's very displeased about this. But when they arrived at the threshing floor of Nacon, the oxen stumbled and Uzzah reached out his hand and steadied the ark of God. Look at this. Then the Lord's anger was aroused against Uzzah and God struck him dead because of this. Now keep in mind, this happened during this great big worship service. Now I want you to get that. That's real important. Don't blow it off. That's very important. This great big worship time's going on. And, and the cart is, is, is stumbled. The oxen, you know, it's stumbled. And so you don't want to let the cart, the, the ark fall on the ground. So Uzzah just reached out to kind of steady it. And then God kills him. It doesn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense to them. It really didn't make any sense to David. So watch this. So Uzzah died right there. Beside the ark of God, David was angry because the Lord's anger had burst out against Uzzah. Uzzah. He named that place Perez Uzzah, which means to burst out against Uzzah. And it is still called the same thing today. David was now afraid of the Lord. And he asked, how can I ever bring the ark of the Lord back into my care? The ark of the Lord. Now, I, I skipped a few verses. And I did this to kind of shorten up what I... But it, what they did, Obed-Edom. They didn't know what to do with the ark. And the ark ended up at Obed-Edom's place for three months. And this is where we catch this. Now, the ark of the Lord remained there in Obed-Edom's house for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his entire household. Then King David was told, the Lord has blessed Obed-Edom's household and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went there. Now, there's a lot that's just happened that it's not written down. David really did some research. <laughs> he was seeking God. He was so blown away by what happened. And during this time, he found out one thing, that you don't put the ark on a cart. It has to be carried a certain way. He learned, he learned some very important things. One thing was that you can be singing, dancing, praising, and I'm not saying that's wrong because we're going to see it again in a moment. But don't think all your praising is going to cover up something God wants to deal with you on. And so, anyhow, so David went there and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with a great celebration. Now look at this. This is very interesting. After the men who were carrying the ark, it wasn't on a cart, and you talk about the fear. You know what? The fear of God's a good thing to have. You know, we kind of, we kind of think today, well, we sh you know, a fear of God, I'm talking about an absolute overwhelming respect. A res not where you just tremble like you're scared to death God's going to do something. There's very little fear of God in our society today. Very, I mean, we're so, God's our buddy. He's our pal. He's our friend. Well, there's a, there is a certain amount of truth, but he's almighty God. Do you get that? He's almighty God. He deserves everything from us. He should never be treated like a buddy. And look at this. After the men were carrying the ark of the Lord, had gone six steps. Do you realize six steps, how short that is? They went six steps, six steps. And so every time they went six steps, David sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. We have no idea how long this trip took, but it had to take a long time. There was a lot of blood being shed, sacrifices being made because of this. And David danced. See, I'm not saying this is wrong by any means, he danced before the Lord with all his might, wearing a priestly garment. But as the ark of the Lord entered the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, who was also the wife of David, looked down from her window 
When she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she was filled with contempt for him. She was extremely angry about him. Now, when David returned home to bless his own family, boy, you talk about getting slapped in the face. Here he goes home to really bless his family. He wants to bless his wife. And he's, got, he's so happy, he's so happy. And he gets hit with his wife saying this to him. When David returned home to bless his family, Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. She said in disgust, how distinguished the king of Israel looked today, shamelessly exposing himself to the servant girls like any vulgar person might do. Whoa. This is one of David's greatest days in his life. <laughs> I mean, this was, this was something else. And his wife, this is her way of, of celebrating with him. So I left some verses out. But he had some strong things to say about her. But look at this. This tells you a whole lot. One verse tells you a lot. So Michael, the daughter of Saul, remained childless throughout her entire life. So that goes to show you how intimate he was with his wife after that statement. That was it. I want you to compare the symbol, the Bible calls a symbol, a copy, a shadow, to what the symbol truly represents. So in Hebrews, it says, but only the high priest ever entered the most holy place, and only once a year. Now compare that, compare that, verses so let us come boldly to the throne of of our gracious God. There will we find, let me just back up one more second. I want you to see it was only once a year. Once a year. Now let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. I could sit here on my own and just look at this, look at that. Look at that and think, oh, God, oh, God. I'll share something personal with you, and please trust me. I'm not sharing this in a, in a bad way, in an egotistic way or not. You know, I, I've shared with you before that Sue and I, we, we pray together every day, and it's, it's a highlight of our day. And the longer we've done this, the longer our prayer time becomes. And it's almost difficult to stop because, you know, we ask the Lord, Lord, show us, bring to our mind who we should be standing in the camp for. And, and the thoughts just keep coming and coming. And, oh, God, yes, yes, yes. When you understand that your prayers are incense before the throne of God in heaven, it changes everything. He, del he delights so much in your prayers. He delights in your prayers. I mean, it's like, it's like a husband and wife embracing and just loving each other and just loving each other. That's how he feels when we pray. I mean, we have no idea. You know, that the Bible calls it a sweet aroma, a sweet aroma in the presence of God. Do you ever think that your prayers are a sweet aroma in the presence of God? I'll tell you what, when that gets in your heart, you just want to keep praying and praying and praying. It's, oh, God, oh, God, what else do you want me to pray about, Lord? And you begin, you, you begin to pray less about, I mean, you pray about these things, but you just can't wait to pray about the things that he really wants you to pray about for other people and situations. And it just, it just makes such a difference. Much of what's in the Old Testament is a copy, as I said, a shadow, type, and symbol that is fulfilled in Jesus. There's so many things in the Old Testament. You know, in the Old Testament, Jesus is concealed. In the New Testament, Jesus is revealed. And I, I encourage a young Christian, or even encourage any Christian, be saturated with the New Testament. Read it and read it and read it 
and read it. When you go back to the Old Testament, then you start seeing Jesus in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament just become, it just takes on a whole new life, a whole new life. It's just beautiful. Back to Hebrews. And since every high priest is required to offer gifts and sacrifices, our high priest must make an offering too. What was that offering? You know? You know. It was himself. He made himself an offering to God. If he were here on earth, he would not even be a priest, since there are already priests who offer the gifts required by the law. They serve in a system of worship that, look at this, that is only a copy, a shadow of the real one in heaven. For when Moses was getting ready to build the tabernacle, God gave him this warning. Be sure that you make everything according to the pattern I've shown you here on the mountain. I would, that would be amazing to see that. What, what Moses saw. It would be amazing. But now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. If the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need for a second covenant to replace it. It is so important to understand what we've been talking about so far so that you can understand what I'm going to get into now. Because like I opened up with, this is an analogy, and I think you're going to be amazed as you see this. Now we're going to go back to 1 Samuel 4. We're going to go back prior to when David went to bring the ark into the city. Now we're going to go see what happened prior to that. So now there's war with the Philistines. The Philistines capture the ark. And this, and, and this is all in 1 Samuel 4. At that time, Israel was at war with the Philistines. The Israelite army was camped near Ebenezer, and the Philistines were at Apex. The Philistines attacked and defeated the army of Israel, killing 4,000 men. After the battle was over, the troops retreated to their camp, and the elders of Israel asked, Why? Why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines? Now we're going to bring this really up to date. This is so, this is such a picture of us today, and, and I, I'm trusting and praying that you get this. Because it is remarkable. This is us today. Why? Why, God, did you allow this? Or why? Why? What happened? The Israelites were completely oblivious to their spiritual emptiness. People, I'm telling you what my convictions are. This may not be yours. I have the deepest conviction that all the noise we make and all the chatter we do, I believe the church today is in deep darkness. I believe there's... Now, I don't mean every single person. You know, Elijah one time told God, he said, Lord, I'm the only one left. God, I'm the only one. And the Lord spoke to him and said, no, you're not. I've got 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And so I don't want you to come across, Todd, do you think you're the only one? Of course not. But I'm telling you that the majority of the church today in America, because I don't live in other parts of the world, but I see that the same things are happening there too. Paul wrote Timothy a verse that is meant for us today, but it can be applied to them then. And this is out of 2 Timothy. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Now, you know what they just got done saying. They were, there was a large defeat 4,000 of their men were, were slaughtered. God, why would you let this happen? What did we do when COVID happened? Oh, God, why did you let this happen? What's what? How come? We complain about a lot of stuff, and I'll show you some of that in just a little bit. Many of us are asking the same questions, and here you go. Why do we have such an ungodly government trying to destroy our nation? Well, I know why. 
I really do know why. Because I believe that the world here in our country reflects the church. I believe that with all of my heart and soul. The Bible says that we are to be salt and light. Well, we've lost our saltiness, and we sure our light is awful dim. And that's why we have a government run the way it is. You know, a guy asked me, this has been years ago, but a guy asked me one time, he said, Todd, can you tell me why this world's going to hell? That's what, exactly what he said. I looked in his eyes. I said, yes, sir, I can. And he, I don't know what he was waiting to hear me say, but I looked at him and I said, it's my fault. It's my fault. And he looked at me with a real puzzled look. What do you mean? And I told him, I said, I said, you know, the Bible says the church, I just, what I told you, I said, the church is to be salt and light. I failed. I have really failed. My, and, and that's why you see what you see. And I believe with all my heart that if the church was making less noise and recognizing the holiness of God and walking with him and seeking God and seeking his face, doing 2 Chronicles 7, 14, there would be a change in the world. We don't need a revival. People say, well, I'm praying for, I don't, don't pray for a revival. Pray for a tremendous awakening of God. That's what we need. We don't need a revival where we go to some meeting and get excited for a week or two and then it dies off in about a month or two. We need an awakening to shake us to the core of who we are. That's honestly what we need. Here's another, why? Why, God? Why have we killed 63 million babies with absolutely no intention of stopping? Right here in Illinois, we have a governor that prides himself on Illinois being a wonderful place for abortions. I don't know if you've come in from Missouri when you cross the bridge and see Illinois signs. Welcome to Illinois, the home of safe abortions. It's pathetic. It's pathetic. But we live in that state. He wants to compete with California, and he's doing a great job of it. Here's another question. Why? Why is sin so rampant in our nation and continually increasing? Well, these are just a few questions that we scream about. And all you got to do is look in the mirror. All you got to do is go in the bathroom and look in the mirror. And you can answer a lot of these questions. Now we're going to go back to 1 Samuel 4, uh, 4. And when the Philistines actually capture the ark. Then they said, now remember, then they said, now let me help you. This goes back to when they said, God, why did you let this happen to us? And now we continue from that. Then they said, let's bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh. If we carry it into battle with us, it will save us from our enemies. That's how we think today about the church. Somebody gets in despair, whatever, I'm going to start going to church. Somebody's life starts falling apart. I'm going to go to church. I just got to get back in church. Well, I, I'm going to say more about that in a minute. I'm not going to run ahead of myself. We've looked, here we go, we've looked at the church the same way they saw the Ark of the Covenant. Remember this? Remember 911? Do you remember what that did in our country for just a little while? The September 11th, 2001 terrorist attack led to a brief, Brief increase in church attendance. In the days and weeks following the attacks, many Americans reported praying more often. However, according to Duke professor Mark Chavez, the increase in church attendance was very short-lived. Can't you all say amen to that? You went through it. You went through it. You know. What about COVID? How do we act during COVID? People were panicked when we couldn't go to church. People were panicked. Said, so, oh, no, they're not letting us go to church. Do you mean you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ unless you go to that building? Is that what you're saying? Now, I realize, you know what the Bible says, well, don't forsake your own sibling together. You know what, we've taken that and we use that to church, and really it's a poor example. Christians need to be meeting together any place, anytime, anywhere and just fellowshipping together. me I'm not saying, I'm not doing this down on church. So please don't misunderstand me. But we treat church today like they treated the ark back then. I mean, exactly. 
Tracy Massell, and she works for George Barna from the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University, says this. We continue to witness the devastating effects of COVID-19 combined with the societal responses, including government lockdowns, violations of constitutional rights, and church shutdowns on the faith of Americans. A new report from the groundbreaking study of faith in post-pandemic America from Dr. George Barna and the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University identifies three significant areas of spiritual decline since COVID. Church attendance, church affiliation, and core beliefs. Now, I want to be real honest with you. Something's really wrong. Something's really wrong. You know, the Bible says that in the last days before the Lord comes back, there's going to be a great falling away. The Bible also calls it an apostasy. People will be, many people will be staying in churches, but their heart has fallen away. But if COVID created what you're looking at here, my question is, why? It's very easy to answer. It's very easy to answer. It exposed that people had a relationship with church instead of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know you can go to church all your life and never truly be born again. Never. Yesterday, I went and met two friends in Nashville for pizza. And I can't pronounce the name of that pizza place. It doesn't matter, but I love that little pizza shop. So I had two friends we met. And there was this real sweet young lady was our server. And I'm always, always, always doing my best all the time. I carry, uh, I carry these coins with me. I try my best. And so I asked this young girl. I shared that with her. And I always do it so full of love. And, you know, Keith has seen me do it. And so this, this girl was so sweet. And uh, I shared that with her. And I said, I want you to, it says you can miss heaven by 14 inches. And I said, I would like for you just to think about it, please. Just think about it. And we'll talk about it in a little while. Well, it was a little bit later she came back, just as sweet as she could be. She says, I think I maybe know what maybe that means. I said, okay. She said, does, does the 14 inches have anything to do with your heart? And I said, wow. I said, you're so close. I said, what do you think that you, what, what does it really mean about your heart? And she wasn't quite sure. And her name was Sophie. And I said, Sophie, that 14 inches is the distance between your head and your heart. And she said, well, I really think I've got him both places. I've got him in my head. I got him in my heart. And I said, well, I really pray that you do. She said, well, I'm a Catholic, and I go down here to St. Mary's, or she said the church. And I said, well, that's good. But I said, Sophie, let me just share something. And I'm not being down. I'm not saying this in the wrong way. But I said, Catholics put so much emphasis on the building, on the building, going to the building. And I said, Sophie, you really need to have Jesus in your heart. In your, and I shared a little bit with her. And she listened so respectfully. But we live in a society where we are saturated with a mentality that I'm a Christian. And what does a Christian do? A Christian goes to church. What more do you really expect out of me? I go to church. And I try to be there every time the doors are open. I want you to think about that the way the Israelites thought about the Ark of the Covenant. They said, we, we lost this battle because the Ark wasn't with us. Now, they completely, totally missed the whole concept of the Ark. They weren't even to touch it. They had no business touching it. So the things that God really cared about, they completely ignored. It became an idol. I wonder in America how much the building, the church building, has become an idol. Well, let's look at a little bit more. Who, now I ask the question, why? Why? Why did this happen? Who or what is the object of your faith? I know what I'm talking about. I've been a pastor for many, 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 many years. I know what I'm talking about. And I have so many regrets. If I could go back and redo years of what I did, it would be done so differently. There's been such a radical, eye-opening uh, experience in my life 
I mean this from the depth of my soul, I mean it. I know that our church was filled with people that weren't saved. But I, like all other pastors, you think, pastors think they can solve everything from the pulpit. They can solve it from the pulpit. If I had it to do over again, I would make it a point, and we had a large church, I would make it a point to get into every house, every home, and talk to every person. At times, I made pastoral visits, and I loved the Lord, but I was stupid. I was spiritually stupid about some stuff. And I would make a nice visit, and we could talk about whatever they wanted to talk about, and I wouldn't have enough guts to say, well, I really want to know, how are you doing spiritually? And I, I regret that. I have cried out to the Lord so many times, God, forgive me for my lack of maturity, my lack of spiritual maturity. We're going to go back to chapter 4, and we're going to continue this. So here we go. So they sent men to Shiloh. Now remember, they said, we got, we got defeated because we didn't have the ark with us. Okay, guys, you've got a good point. So they sent men to Shiloh to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord of heaven's armies, who is enthroned between the cherubim. Hophni and Phinehas, they were sons of Eli. Now there was a man of God, the Bible doesn't say who he was, but there was a man of God who came to Eli. And he prophesied to Eli. Eli let his sons do anything they wanted to do. And God was angry. Hophni and Phinehas were really ungodly men. The women who came to serve at the tabernacle, they would have sex with. And it went on and on. Sacrifices that were brought. They would treat it in an ungodly manner. And the prophet came to Eli and said, all these things will happen and in the same day, your sons are going to die. And he said, Eli, why haven't you taken control of your sons? And so, well, that says a lot. Okay, Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, were also there with the ark. And so their duty was to do what? Protect the ark. They were to protect the ark. Allowing somebody to come in and take the ark was a very ungodly thing for them to do. So they were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When all the Israelites saw the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord coming into the camp, look at this, their shout of joy was so loud it made the ground shake. Well, now we have another praise service going on. Glory to God! The Ark is coming in! Boy, did they ever have it wrong. I wonder, honestly, I wonder at times at some of our meetings across the land when we shout and clap and make racket, and God's thinking, oh. Do you ever think about that? Do you ever think about it? Aren't you glad our God is a God of the heart? Not racket, he's a God of the heart. But here they are, they're shouting, they're making, and it's so loud, it made the ground shake. Look how the Philistines responded. What's going on, the Philistines asked. What's all the shouting about in the Hebrew camp? When they were told it was because the ark of the Lord had arrived, they panicked. Now, these Philistines were ungodly heathen people, but they actually had more faith than Israelites did because they remembered what God had done and God's own people didn't. Look what they said. The gods have come into their camp, they cried. This is a disaster. We've never had to face anything like this before. Help! Who can save us from these mighty gods of Israel? They are the same gods. Now remember, they're saying God. They don't know. They're saying gods when it was only one God. They are the same gods who destroyed the Egyptians with plagues when Israel was in the wilderness. Fight as never before, Philistines. If you don't, we will become the Hebrew slaves just as they had been ours. Stand up like men and fight. So the Philistines fought. Desperately. And Israel was defeated again. The slaughter was great. 30,000 Israelite soldiers died that day. The survivors turned and fled to their tents. Now, there's times that we do things and then we, people make the remark, well, 
at least our intentions were good. We meant well. Now, how many times have you heard people say, well, God knows our heart? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he does know your heart. That's where you better really have some fear of God inside of you. We're always excusing ourselves, playing this religious card as if, well, God understands. Yeah, the sad thing is he really does understand. The ark of God was captured. And look at this. And Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were killed just as the man of God told their dad what would happen. Now, I didn't record this, but it's in the same... When, they, when, when word came back to Eli, and Eli was scared to death. You know, he was scared to death. Here his sons let the ark be taken. And he was, he was actually more scared about the ark than he was his sons. And when, when word came back and Eli said, tell me what's happened, tell me, tell me. He said, well, your sons are dead. That actually didn't shake him too bad. But when they said, and the ark has been captured, remember he was a heavy man. He was sitting on the wall. And it was like he, it just it knocked him. It just, he fell off the wall and broke his neck and died the very same day. The Israelites did not seek God. They wanted the object that they thought was God. Now, I want to take time and please let this soak in deep. The flesh part of you, the flesh part of us, it's much easier to try to create something that looks holy because we get more involved in that than letting God dig us deep in our soul. God cares about the heart. All this outward stuff means little to him. The heart. So we're going to go now to 1 Samuel 5, and the ark is in now, it's in Philistia. <laughs> this is amazing. The Israelites thought if we just get the ark, we're going to win, we're going to win. And there was a terrible slaughter. 30,000 of the Israelites got slaughtered because God expected his people to understand more. Now the ark is in the company of, is, is, is possessed by heathen people. And God is going to display his power to them. He didn't do it with his own people, but he's going to do it now. And watch how this comes out. After the Philistines captured the ark of God, they took it from the battleground of Ebenezer to the town of Ashdod. They carried the ark of God into the temple of Dagon and placed it beside an idol of Dagon. But when the citizens of Ashdod went to see it the next morning, Dagon had fallen with his face to the ground in front of the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him in his place again. You know what? When spiritual darkness has overtaken somebody, they are blind to the nth degree. You would think people would, you'd think there would be a revival. You would think, wow, here we think Dagon is God. Look at this, our God's on his face. This must be the real God. But no, look at this, look at this. So they took Dagon and put him in his place again. <laughs> he's, the, he's the symbol of their God, but they got to really get him back up. But the next morning, the same thing happened. Dagon had fallen face down before the ark of the Lord again. This time, they didn't get the message yesterday, this time his head and hands were broken off and were lying in the doorway. Only the trunk of his body was left intact. It's like God saying, let me see if you can get, the, get it this time. You, you didn't quite get it yesterday. Maybe you'll get it today. Maybe you'll get it today. <laughs> so that is why, look, they, look what they do with it. That is why this day, to this day, neither the priest of Dagon nor anyone who enters the temple of Dagon in Ashdod will step on its threshold. Isn't that something? That's what they got out of this. They didn't get out of this that there must be something about that Hebrew God that we don't know anything about. But no, that's a holy spot where he lost his head and arms and everything. So we're just not going to step on that anymore. So here we go. Dagon anymore who enters the temple in Ashdod will step on a threshold. Then the Lord's heavy hand he said, okay, you don't get it, I'll do something else. Then the Lord's heavy hand struck the people of Ashdod and the nearby villages with a plague of tumors, 
When the people realized what was happening, they cried out, we can't keep the ark of the God of Israel here any longer. He's against us. Well, God's making his point. He's really making his point. We will all be destroyed along with Dagon, our God. So they called together the rulers of the Philistine towns and asked, what should we do with the ark of God of Israel? The rulers discussed it and replied, move it to the town of Gath. So they moved the ark of the God of Israel to Gath. But when the ark arrived at Gath, the Lord's heavy hand fell on its men, young and old. He struck them with a plague of tumors, and there was a great panic. So they sent the ark of God to the town of Ekron. But when the people of Ekron, now see the news is really getting out. The news is getting out. But when the people of Ekron saw it coming, they cried out, they are bringing the ark of the God of Israel here to kill us too. The people summoned the Philistine rulers again and begged them, please send the ark of God of Israel back to its own country or it will kill us all. For the deadly plague from God had already begun and great fear was sweeping across the town. Wow, God made a point. He made a point. He made a point with this heathen nation. He made quite a point. Those who didn't die were afflicted with tumors, and the cry from the town rose to heaven. Now, for the sake of time, I think you would find it quite interesting. And I would encourage you, if you want, just get Samuel out and read these same chapters and go to chapter 6. The Philistines returned the ark. It was amazing how God displayed his power to the Philistines on the manner it was sent back. It's really amazing. God made it clear to the Philistines that yes, the God of the Hebrews is almighty God. Don't go by what my people are doing. You would never know it if you look at them. But I'll show you how mighty I am. The appearance of holiness has nothing to do with genuine holiness. Now think about that, and I'm going to make this really clear to you. The appearance of holiness has nothing to do with genuine holiness. Without holiness, you'll never see God. That's what the Bible says. And just a few weeks ago, I shared how the doctrine now so big in America is sin. You don't have to worry about sin anymore. That's all done away. You don't have to worry about it. Jesus solved that 2,000 years ago. What a lie from the pit of hell. Every day the Holy Spirit wants to deal with you, and if you have a thought cross your mind or a, something came out of your mouth or an action with your spouse or something, yes, it's sin, and you still need to deal with it. And so if you don't have holiness, you're not going to see God. This is in Hebrews. Work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. I didn't write that. God did. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. That's a very interesting, probing statement. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau who traded his birthright as the firstborn son for a single meal. Man, and you're going to see this, man will go to extremes trying to create the appearance of holiness. At the same time, ignoring holiness that comes from the heart through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There is no substitute for that. Now again, take a look at the beauty of this. And God wanted it made that way. He, he said, that's why Bezalel. He said, I have chosen Bezalel. I have filled him with the Holy Spirit and all craftsmanship. I want it done right. I don't want it sloppy. I want it done right. Well, he, he had a purpose, but they missed the bottom line because they got caught up in the appearance of holiness, and they missed that this is only representing. This is only, if you think this is holy, that's why he wanted it so perfect. He wanted it so perfect. You see how perfect this is? That's only a fraction of how perfect I am. But they didn't get it. They didn't understand it. 
Now, take a look at this, and take a look at this. There are cathedrals in our land. I cannot, I cannot fathom the, uh, the, the, just the intense craftsmanship, the beauty. It's, it's all inspiring. I don't know if you've ever been into, uh, um, oh, what's it called? The St. Louis, down in New Orleans. St. Louis Cathedral. Have you ever been in it, anybody? Here, St. Louis Cathedral. I've been in it. I've been in it. And there's, and there's nuns, sisters, that are there to really guard how you come in and what you do. If you have a hat on, they're going to rip that hat off. <laughs> they're going to, and I, it's okay. It's all right. But we get caught up in the appearance, in the appearance of holiness, in the appearance of God. I'm not here to just slander and be mean. I'm here to try to tell the truth. Like I said before, I've got all kinds of relatives that are Catholic. I understand it. I, I think a week or two ago, I shared about it. When you walk in here, they want your breath to be taken away by the, by the magnificence of the cathedral. They want your breath to almost be taken away. And when you come in, the, I mean, when you come in, the Catholic, they, they, they show enormous reverence, and they should. We ought to be ashamed how we treat Protestant churches. We go in cutting up, laughing, joking. When it's time, for, I mean, we, we act really bad. We ought to show some reverence. There's a balance here somewhere. But when the Catholics come into their cathedral, they show enormous reverence. But when they leave it, they're away from it. Do you understand that? In other words, when you're there in it, wow, I'm in the presence of God here. You know what? No. This is a man-made structure on earth. It is here to represent God's presence. But what are you going to do when you leave? What are you going to do when you walk out? And there's so much of this done. Look here. Look at, the, look at the structure holding the Bible. There's all that gold. Look at, the go, look at the goblets and the glass. Look at what the priest is wearing. I'm not being mean. I'm just saying, you know what God's saying? Why did he shut the doors in, in Malachi? He said, just shut the doors, would you? Just shut the doors. I'm sick of this. Because they were so caught up in, in the appearance of things. But where was their heart? Now, this is what God's after. That's what he's after. He doesn't care how big the cathedral is, how decorated it is, all the artwork, the stained glass, the beauty of it. He doesn't care. He wants to look at our heart and see the beauty in our heart. That's what he wants to see. This is what he wants to see. This means more to God than all the cathedrals in the world. This means more to him. David said, oh, Lord, you're not pleased with all the sacrifices I'd given to you. But Lord, you're looking for a broken and contrite spirit. God, you will not despise. People, my heart is crying. My heart is crying. I'm telling you, I don't know why God is making these things real to me. But I don't apologize for it. I'm not trying to prove anything. I'm trying to be obedient. America and the world itself is in sad, sad, sad shape. What you're looking at here, with this look at this, look at this guy. Look at this. This is what he wants. He's not impressed with all this other stuff. He wants your heart. King Solomon actually got it. He lost it. He lost it because he let his heart be taken away with all his 700 wives, 1,000 concubines, Kind of, got him off, kind of got him off course. King Solomon understood that even though the temple he made was so massive and majestic, it was only a symbol of God's presence, only a symbol that God himself was far greater and much higher than this earthly temple. And this is what Solomon said. This is how he prayed. But, but will God, when he, when, he, when he dedicated the temple... His heart was right. His heart was right. And this is how he prayed. But will God really live on earth? I mean, he got it. He really got it. 
Why, even the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple I've built. Nevertheless, listen to my prayer and my plea. Oh, Lord, my God. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is making to you today. May you watch over this temple night and day, this place where you have said my name will be there. May you always hear the prayers I make towards this place. May you hear the humble and earnest requests from me and your people Israel when we pray toward this place. Yes, hear us from heaven where you live. You don't live in this magnificent temple. You don't live here. God, hear us from heaven where you live. And when you hear, forgive. So what does the Lord require of you? What does he require of me? Is he pleased, people? I, hope, I trust you're hearing the heart of God. I'm not telling anybody not to go to church or leave. I'm there. That's why we do this on Friday night. So we don't compete with anybody on Sunday morning. But what does the Lord require of you? This is Micah. What can we bring to the Lord? Should we bring him burnt offerings? Should we bow before God most high with offerings of yearling calves? Should we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? No. Oh, people, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you. To do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And I want to sum it up in the end with this. Examine your heart. This means more to the Lord Jesus Christ than if you've never missed one church service in your entire life. What's your prayer life like? What is your Bible study like? And how are you at sharing your faith? These three things will absolutely turn your life inside out. Pray. If you want to memorize a verse, I know you probably memorized one verse, Jesus wept. But here's another one that you can, you can memorize. It's in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians. Never stop praying. Never stop praying. How about reading? How about studying? How about, how about embracing God's word? Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. That's what he wants from us. That we know what we're saying and we know what we're saying is true. And don't be shy in sharing your faith, talking to people, talking to people. Get to the place. I, I'm going to share this with you. I didn't plan to do this. I told Sue. <laughs> I, was on my, I went for a ride on my motorcycle the other day, and I went down to Fern Cliff. And I was going through Fern Cliff. And I saw a big group of a family. I guess they were all camping together there. There was a lot of people. And I came so close to turning around and riding up to their, to their camp <laughs> and getting out. And I keep a lot of my coins even on my motorcycle. And I was going to get out and I was going to say, hey, everybody, you can ask me to leave if you really want to. But I'm on a mission to really try to talk to people. And I would love to just take up five minutes of your time. I came so close. I didn't do it. But here's the thing. I want to be at the place where if the Lord slightly nudges me. Have you ever heard, this, have you ever heard of this girl called Whitney Lynn? I, I love her. I respect her. And I've got a video of her. She, she's the boldest person I think I've ever seen in my life. Right before, right, right before Easter, she went into Walmart. And she went into Walmart. And I, it's on my Facebook page. And she said, hey, Walmart. 
I mean, she, she belted it out. Hey, Walmart, if you look where the carts are, the carts are all gone. If you go back to the drinks, they're all gone. You know why? Because Sunday we're going to celebrate the greatest day of the year. We're going to celebrate Jesus Christ. He was raised from the dead. <laughs> and there's all these people around looking at her like, man, this woman has lost her marvels. But I looked at that and I thought, wow, wow. I mean, I really, now you're say, Todd, if you're, if you're going to be like that, warn me so I won't be with you. But, but you know what? Pray for God. You know what? How often do you share your faith? Has the Lord, re oh, look, this comes out of Psalms. I love it, I love it, I love it. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Tell others he has redeemed you from your enemies. And what do we do? We're scared to death to say anything. Well, I hope you're encouraged, and I hope you got the analogy. The Israelites, the Israelites missed it because they saw the representative thing of God and totally missed the real God. And there's millions of people, I know it for a fact, that go to church every Sunday, and they don't get it. And they start watching, they start looking at their watch, they know the routine, they're anxious to get out, but they've done their duty. They've made their offering for the week. That's not what God's asking for. You understand that, don't you? You understand it. Well, thank you, precious Jesus. Thank you, Lord.